to I'm a born rebel mm. uh, and I usually rebel against things that I think are wrong mm. like uh, uh, for instance when I was a school when I was a small kid there were no schools for girls it was considered indecent improper you don't send girls to school but uh, luckily my parents also understood that and they allowed me to go to school they allowed me to read they allowed me to go to school and learn uh, until I was old enough and I was able to get a scholarship but I was the first Somali girl who ever got a scholarship to study in Europe mm. went to London studied came back as the first qualified Somali nurse midwife oh. and uh, I also became eligible to enter the senior civil service because before I returned there were some men who had returned from England who had done nursing but had not done any other further training education specialization and they were given a grade in the civil service which I thought was below the grade that I should have the problem was that the Somali government at that time in 1960 didn't think that I should be in the civil service at all because I was a female and it took them 22 months to decide to give me a salary and I refused to leave I worked for 22 months without a salary I had no leave I had no no benefits I had no uniform I had no no promotion no salary nothing and I continued to work and they kept saying but you, you're not employed why are you here nobody's giving you a salary I said well if I leave today that door will be closed to every Somali girl I am eligible for the senior civil service I'm qualified to enter that grade people that are junior to me and less qualified than me have been given that grade I have a right to be in that grade and whether you give me a salary or not that's the job I will be doing my patients need me the hospital need me you think about it so they had to discuss it in Parliament in Mogadishu and you know how are we going to give a thousand shillings to a girl what is she going to do with all that money and a thousand shillings is what something less than five hundred dollars that was the grade at that time and then they would say but her father is rich she lives with her family she lives with her parents she doesn't need money and all these you know she shouldn't have money because she doesn't need it or she shouldn't have money because she shouldn't have it because she's a female and it took them 22 months until finally they gave in and they gave me the grade and the qualification that my position was eligible for during that time there was also when I was a student in England I, I I had a you know my friends my colleagues and you know as friends you you put your money together and, and a Dutch girl and I Annika Myers a very good friend of mine we saved up 50 pounds and we bought a little old car we learned to drive we bought a car and we drove in London and each time my father came to London I gave him a lift in my car so when I came home I would ask my father for the key of the car and he would give it to me so I would be stopped by the police you're not allowed to drive and why not because you're a girl I said, I'm sorry but I drive everywhere else in the world there's no reason why I shouldn't drive here no but you don't have a license so I say sure I have here yeah, this is my British license oh but that's British you must have a Somali license okay give me the license test me give me a driving test we can't because you're a woman sorry I drove in London with 12 million people and here there's less than 50 cars in all of her gates and you want don't want me to drive I'm sorry I have a license I'm qualified to drive I'm driving and they would go to my father and they would say please dr. Adam we found your daughter driving again please don't give her your car she's breaking the law she's and he would say no she's not I give her my car because she's competent you don't think I would give my daughter my car if I didn't think she was competent then they would say okay well let us we the police we will give you 
a driver for your daughter. She can drive her wherever she wants and we will pay the salary of that driver. And then my father would say, what? I would trust my car, my daughter with your driver? No way. You give her a license. If she's competent, you give her a license. And it took them six months and we played cat and mouse, you know, Tom and Jerry. I had different keys made. They would take my keys away. I would go home, get another set of keys, drive my car. And my father was really someone who, who stood beside me and I appreciated that. So this is how I started life. I've always been a rebel. And then I married and my husband at that time became prime minister. And then there was the revolution. And even the time when he was a prime minister, I continued to teach, I continued to deliver patients, I continued to, 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 to train students. Because for me, this was a very important time. If I, as the first lady of the country, could show students what discipline is, and could teach students that patients are important, they are even more important than me, who is the first lady, the wife of the prime minister, this is a message that I wanted my students to have. I wanted my students to understand that when I say no long nails, my nails are cut, I'm the wife of the prime minister, nobody's going to tell me cut your nails, but I do when I'm in the hospital, I'm going to care for patients, I have to take the rules of the hospital. And I expect you as students to accept that rule as well. So these were messages that I wanted to put across. That the, 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 to, to give the importance to patients, to sick, to the poor, to the needy, to those who have no voice, to those who cannot, like me, have an access to a microphone or, 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 a, or an audience. So when we had the revolution and my husband was in jail and they put me under house arrest and they took my house and they took everything I had, um, and I was living with my mother. I, they would, my mother and my sister would give me clothes. I had nothing. And uh, the way I got myself rehabilitated back into society was again through an emergency. It was, there was a fire in, in the Juba Hotel in Mogadishu once and I heard this on the radio. And uh, I heard that there were many casualties and a lot of people were burnt and injured. And I thought, oh my God, the hospital cannot cope with you know, this number of the size of an emergency. So I just went to the hospital and, and started dressing and taking care of the patients. And this became my way of re-entering again uh, my profession or, the, or hospitals because it was I was there, I was in the hospital, there was an emergency, I was taking care of people, I was organizing uh, patients where they were going to be, their dressings and so on. And it was at the end of the emergency, uh, many, many hours later, I was just part of the team. And it was a fait accompli. Nobody had to sign a paper to release me or to give me permission. I was there, finished. But whenever they had a chance, they would arrest me or they would say, oh, you're an anti-revolutionary, you're a capitalist pig. And, you're an imperialist stooge and they would search my house, they would do whatever. But that's, uh, you know, I, I would just continue from there. They would come, arrest me, I would come out, go to work the next day, finished. That was my way of resisting. I didn't have the muscle or the gun or the power to resist them otherwise. I would just come out of jail and just go to work the next day as if nothing had happened. And this was my way of resisting. And I would say, I am not going to show them that they have hurt me. I will not show them that they have humiliated me. I will not admit it to them that I hurt inside. I will not show it. And uh, in fact, my patients were the ones that were my, my best sedative, my best treatment because I just threw myself in my work. I would care for someone who would be very sick, very dirty, very weak, in danger of life and death, and I would forget all my problems. And that would help me to, to forget the humiliation that I had suffered yesterday or, or the day before. So these were the kind of things that you, you learn to, uh, to adjust to. 
And for instance, at one time they, I was, I was back in the civil service. I was made the rector of a, of the Ministry of Health Department of Training. And one day they call me and they say, ah, but you cannot be given that position after all because you have not done your military service. I said, come on, military service. I'm 38 years old. Come on, what military service do you want me to do? Said, ah, but this is a revolutionary regime. This is a Marxist regime. Everybody must do their military service. And so I knew that they had made up their minds. They were going to send me to military camp anyway. They were going to, to get me to do my military training anyway. If I plead and say, please don't forgive me, I was the first lady, I'm, this is below my dignity, I, you cannot do this, I'm a woman, I'm old, none of this would have worked. So I took out my old resistance again. I said, okay, if this is what you want to do, good. I've always wanted to be in the army. This will be a new experience for me. I've, I'm a nurse, I'm used to physical work. Wonderful, great, when do I start? And this was my way of resisting. And I continued to show them that I didn't hurt. I would get up at three in the morning like everybody. I would be made to run over hills and mountains. I would have my pack on my back, my boots. I would, and I loved it, I enjoyed it. And when I came back, I really convinced myself and I enjoyed it. So it was, it's this sort of kind of psychological uh, it, uh, resistance with a smile became my, my biggest weapon and it worked. And I'm 61 and I'm still resisting. I, when I started to do this hospital, everybody thought I was crazy. And they keep asking me, saying, but you're a woman, you don't have a husband. How can you build a hospital? Don't you have a husband to help you? I said, no, I don't need a husband to help me. This is being built with my money, my energy, my resources. A husband has nothing to do with it. Perhaps if I even had a husband, I wouldn't have all this money left over. So I don't need a man to do this with me, for me. So this is, um, this is a little resume of the kind of rebellions and revolutions I have wow. been in in my life. Amazing. It's, it's yeah. Just thank you very, very, very much. Humiliation. Well, I think humiliation is a very difficult thing to describe, but I think humiliation is when someone tries to bring someone down to their level. They think that you are, uh, you are above them and they want to hurt you, humiliate you, bring you down to their level so that you have no more self-respect and that so that you have, you lose the respect you have for yourself and others lose the respect they have for you. Uh, and I think the worst experience I had was once I was one of the many times they put me in jail. They put me in jail for things like, uh, uh, for instance, once they said I was planning to escape from the country. And I spent six days in jail for that. Now, come on. I mean, why didn't you wait until I tried to escape and then arrest me? Why arrest me from my house and say that I was planning to escape? And they, they put me in jail and they put me in a, in a cell on my own but I didn't have a toilet. And right in front of my of my of the place where they, they put me, there was a big toilet and it had no doors. And there was the cell next to me was full of men, of criminals, of thieves, and I don't know, just, just men all behind the bars. And uh, so I, I called out and I said, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I need to go and use the bathroom. And uh, that's after I had been the first lady of the country. And they said, well, you want to use the bathroom? There's the bathroom. You use everybody's bathroom. There, you're not better than the others. There's the bathroom they use. And I thought, how can I go and use a bathroom with no doors, facing a cell full of men, full of criminals and people who were, you know, and I just came out of my cell and I just looked at those men and I said, listen, I am going to use that bathroom. And would you be watching your mother or your sister if she was using a toilet and she had no door? Is this the kind of men you are that you would watch a woman using a bathroom? And they said, no. And the first one said, they turned around and they made everybody in the cell turn the other way until I finished using the bathroom. And that was one of the most emotional moments of my time. 
and the police were so shocked because they couldn't get their objective they couldn't get me to be humiliated and using a bathroom with all these men watching and shouting at me so that's another form of resistance and resistance resisting humiliation so well does humiliation lead to war i i would answer that question in in by saying yes it does because uh you can push humiliation you can push human beings too far just far enough until they turn back and say hey wait a minute enough is enough and they they then they they begin to resist uh with 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 violence with strength with force with whatever way they know and uh i think a good example of of resisting humiliation by through war is what has happened to to our country uh the people of somaliland uh in fact m- most of the humiliation i was having in mogadishu is because i was someone from somaliland that was also another reason and the people of this when we united with somalia and former british somaliland united with former italian somaliland uh the capital became mogadishu everybody was out there the embassies the job opportunities the hospitals the schools the universities the port the airport everything was out there and the people in this part of the world of the country were being humiliated through insults humiliated through denial of their human rights access to schools schools were being closed to be turned into military camps uh their banks were closed their port was closed the port of berbera which is the a deep water port one of the best in this part of the world was just made redundant um and uh, people resisted in, uh, at first through uh, demonstrations and they got arrested they, they were mass executions there were mass graves that are being dug out right now this place that where we are was one of the places where such in human indignities were were being perpetrated on on people and uh, and then people got to a point when they they say enough is enough and they they just risk their life they have nothing else to lose once they lose their dignity uh, and they're no longer in control of their dignity then they have okay so i was saying that when when people lose when people think that they have been made to lose their dignity uh that's a time when the human being thinks that you have lost everything uh and that's the time when people say okay i will i have nothing else to lose i've lost my dignity and that's when they become uh, desperate they become violent they oppose whatever it is that is oppressing them physically and this is what happened and this is why we had the the armed struggle that started in 1988 when school children it, it all started in 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 uh, in Hargeisa in 1987 88 when school children began to throw stones at at the uh, Siad Barre regime because their schools were closed or they had no teachers uh their curriculum was never respected uh and then students began to throw stones and that was the beginning of of what turned out to be the liberation movement and uh almost half a million people became either killed or hurt or injured and the people left the country and you know somalis fled all over the world i mean you have somalis as far north as in norway uh they are in all corners of the world of of the of the world and uh, of course the regime then began to try and and, and impose its authority by force and he would have the airport here which is 5 kilometers away from us the airport where you just landed Hargeisa airport mig airplanes with fighters would take off from that airport to come and bomb the city here where we are bomb civilians and and women and children and homes and do a 4 kilometer circle and just go and land again in this in this airport that is 5 kilometers away um uh, so humiliation is a form of violence and when that humiliation doesn't kill the person emotionally morally uh then the oppressor tries to use physical harm to kill or silence or impose the authority on people and uh, so since 
I'm not a very physically strong person. I, I don't think I could ever punch anybody on the nose. Uh, the resistance that I use that has helped me is passive resistance. And as long as you know you're right, and as long as you know that you're doing what you feel is right inside you, you shouldn't be afraid to say so. You call a spade a spade. That's it. A spade is always a spade. It cannot be a, anything else. And um, that's it. And people say, oh, you're still a lawyer for everybody. And I say, yeah, of course I'm a lawyer for everybody. And why shouldn't I be a lawyer for those people who, who don't have a voice? And what is my voice if I cannot speak for those people? And I hope I, I, I die doing that. Mm. It's been a wonderful world. It's been a wonderful life. I've learned a lot. I've taught a lot. Mm. I've, I think I've, I've enjoyed it more than I would have if it hadn't been so varied and so it would have been a very boring life. I don't think I could have just continued my life uh, born with a silver spoon in my mouth and then, you know, just continued like that in a, you know, going up and down and in between has been the, 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 the challenge of my life. And now I hope I have enough strength left in me to, to finish this hospital that's taken all my, yeah. my resources. Uh, so thank uh, you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Would it's, you have on. one, two sentences about what you think, how such dictatorships or such, you know, mass humiliation in a way uh, could be prevented in the future or in other parts of the world? What people have to take care of or what people have to be... Well, I, I think oppression should never be allowed to, to progress. It should be, uh, as the British say, nipped in the bud. If people allow someone to, to uh, a dictator, to uh, become too big and too powerful, then it becomes impossible. But if at the beginning people don't elect people like that, they shouldn't elect somebody like that. And if they do have elected and they've made a mistake, they should knock that government down from the beginning. And uh, there's very little you can do, but it's just that people should mobilize themselves and they should not be afraid to, to stand up for their rights. Uh, but it's easy for, for me to say that in the shelter of my own little under my tree. People are hungry, people are poor, people are weak, people are uneducated and they are economically dominated. It's not easy for them. But I think whoever can say enough is enough, should say enough is enough. And uh, I can't think of a magic solution because if that solution existed, I think it would have been used by the millions of people who are living under oppression and the very oppressive regimes in, in many corners of the world, uh, many of them in my own continent in Africa. So I don't know the magic cure, but can I can the international community, what should the international The international community, community should, is usually the one that, that encourages dictators and, and, and oppressors like that to progress. Uh, without mentioning any names, uh, I mean you have uh, government dictators uh, who have millions and billions of dollars in banks. Uh, those billions of dollars were not generated through a salary that they earned or a reward that they were given by the people they were heading, that those billions came from money that belonged to the people, that was given by the international community. And the international community should act intelligently and fairly and honestly and not feed, not allow oppressors to accumulate so much of the people's money. And uh, they should not give them arms, they should not give them money, and they should not help them to remain in power. Because it is the international world that, that maintains dictators to remain in power. The bombs that were being thrown on my people here in Hargeisa in Somaliland were not manufactured by Siad Barre. They came from all corners of the world. They were American, Pakistani, Egyptian, Chinese, Russian, any Czechoslovak, you and Uyugos, anybody who made arms, who made, who made tanks, who made ammunition, sold it 
or gave it to Siad Barre to use against his people. Now, where was the international world when that was being used against the weak? It should have said no. It should have stopped the inflow of arms into Somalia at that time. It should have prevented the onslaught of, of civilians. And um, I, I think the, the uh, international world has different standards. It, it, it preaches um, human rights and fairness and so on in literature in Europe. But then when that humiliation and when that aggression and when that hurt is taking place in a poor, remote, developing country like Somaliland, uh, nobody wants to be bothered, let them stew in their own juice. And uh, these are divided standards and unfair, unfair standards again, against human beings. And I, I mean, it's a, again a humiliation. It is a humiliation, of course, of course. So uh, the international community is, uh, is to blame and I, I hope you have very strong cupboards in which you can lock up your, your conscience. Uh, because all the civilians who died here died of bombs that were manufactured by people in a developed country. And uh, those poor kids and those poor women and those civilians were not military, they were not people who had done anything other than be born in a particular place in a geographical location, period. That was their crime. That was the crime they were being punished for, that they were being humiliated for because they call themselves who they are. They call themselves Somali landers. So uh, that's my little answer. Yeah.